A radar's range resolution is the smallest distance between two targets before they blur into one. Its signal-to-noise ratio tells you how clearly the signal rises above the background noise. Both of these are crucial for identifying and classifying targets, whether that's hard targets like planes or volumetric targets like clouds. Unfortunately though, improving one can hurt the other. I made a video about each of these individually, but here's the gist of why this is. A pulsed radar transmits an RF pulse and waits for it to return. When the pulse echoes off a target, the whole pulse width is returned, which means that if two targets are closer together than the pulse width there and back, then the returned pulses will overlap and you won't be able to tell the two targets apart. For this reason, we want the pulse width to be really small, to decrease the ambiguity of target detection. At the same time, the signal to noise ratio is dependent on the amount of energy the radar transmits and illuminates onto the target. The more energy, or power times time, the more energy is reflected back from the target and the higher our signal power is. The more time we transmit RF, the more clearly we can detect a target. And the more power we transmit, we also get a clearer signal. To summarize, decreasing the pulse width makes our range resolution better, but decreases our signal to noise ratio, and increasing the pulse width degrades the range resolution, but increases our signal to noise ratio. That's a pretty unfortunate trade off, but we don't have to just accept it. In this case, you can have both by using a couple really cool techniques called pulse compression and matched filtering. But this does come with some other trade offs because nothing in radar is free. There's two ways we could go about having both good range resolution and signal to noise ratio. One would be making the pulse as short as possible so we would get a really fine range resolution and then we could find some other way to increase the signal to noise ratio. And the other would be making the pulse longer and find some way to make the range resolution better. I think the second one makes a lot more sense because increasing the pulse width allows us more room to manipulate the signal to our needs while inherently helping the signal to noise ratio. In this long pulse, we could even store some information that helps us with detection later. The other method of using as short a pulse as possible doesn't afford us much room to play with the signal and benefit from it. It's honestly pretty incredible how people came to these findings, so as always you can find some great resources, papers, books, and more in the description, as well as a Python notebook to play around with the concepts yourself. So here's our signal, a relatively long pulse at a single frequency. Currently, if we transmit this, it'll scatter off a target and return the same width, which means the target's range could correspond to any range within this pulse width. But it really only exists at one of these ranges. If we could somehow take this received signal and line it up with the one we transmitted, we could find the first point in this pulse that was scattered off the target. But you might be thinking, wouldn't the start of the pulse always be the part that reflected off the target first? Or, in other words, this part right here that returns to the radar first? Yes, you'd be right, but what makes it more difficult is when there's multiple targets in the scene, so you don't receive a single clear pulse back. You'll receive multiple separate pulses superimposed on one another. Lining up the transmit and receive signals to find the start doesn't make much sense to try doing now, because the transmit signal is just a sine wave and so it could really match up with any point in time, especially when you consider that each target's motion can incur a phase shift on the signal. If we took this sine wave and gave it some structure, this could help us determine the start and end and find exactly where the scattering started. There's a lot of ways to encode information into a signal or modulate a signal. Different ones are used for different applications, but for radar, common modulation schemes include linear frequency modulation, where you ramp frequency over time, and I actually covered this in another video on FMCW radar, and phase coding, where you shift the signal's phase in increments of 180 degrees or 90 degrees normally. Despite the large variety of modulation schemes, there's a commonality between all of them. They take a single frequency carrier, which has zero bandwidth, and turn it into something that has a defined structure and non-zero bandwidth. The introduction of non-zero bandwidth is obvious in the case of linear frequency modulation because you're changing the actual signal's frequency over time, 
but it's less obvious for the phase modulation techniques because the introduction of more bandwidth comes with the introduction of these sharp shifts in the signal rather than the gradual curves of a single frequency sine wave. But we'll get back to how the frequency affects our detection in a minute. For now, let's stick with linear frequency modulation. Now that the signal we're transmitting and receiving has some sort of structure, we can overlay the two and see that at some point, the two very closely overlap. And if we have multiple targets, that overlap will happen multiple times. What we'll actually receive is the superposition of all those signals, so it becomes less obvious where the start and end is, even though we have that defined structure. But now that there is that underlying structure here, we can use something called the cross correlation to find the points in time where there's maximum overlap. Let me show you what I mean. The cross correlation takes the transmit signal, the blue one, and shifts its end to the start of the return signal, the red one. It then takes each point in both signals and multiplies them. To make this pointwise multiplication more clear, let's sample both these signals at discrete intervals and multiply the samples to get a product. Then you take the product of the two and sum all the points values. That then creates our first value. You can then shift the transmit signal one time unit to the right and do the same multiplication and summation to get a second point. This process gets repeated until the transmit signal reaches the end of the receive signal. But let's slow down as we approach the first target. Remember from before that the first target returned a signal pulse around this area. Now there's three targets superimposed, so it's hard to see, but it's still in there. As the transmit pulse gets more and more aligned with that buried target one return, the amplitude will briefly jump up and our cross correlation will show a peak at a point of maximum overlap. You'll also notice some ringing before and after that peak. The cross correlation will show peaks again when it crosses the start of the two other targets returns too. This function is called the cross correlation because it shows us what points in time these two signals are most correlated to one another, or where there's maximum overlap in their structures. In radar, this process is implemented by something called a matched filter. A matched filter is a signal processing operation that maximizes the signal to noise ratio for a known waveform in the presence of some random noise. Mathematically, Matched filtering is equivalent to convolving the received echo with a time-reversed, complex conjugated copy of the transmit pulse. But that's just the same as computing the cross-correlation. That's just how it's implemented in the real hardware. In practice, that's exactly what we've been doing here, sliding one waveform across another to find the point of maximum overlap. So pulse compression is essentially achieved through matched filtering. This is insanely cool, not only because we've pulled three clean peaks out of a messy signal, but because of how thin and tall this peak is. I've actually made this peak much smaller to make the plot easier to read, but in reality it extends this high. See, there's this law in our world that you can't escape called the law of conservation of energy. Meaning, energy can be moved around, but it can't be created or destroyed. So, we're getting these super thin peaks, but they originate from this much wider pulse of energy. And since the energy has to go somewhere, these wide pulses are getting compressed into a thin peak, making the amplitude much higher than before. Hence the name pulse compression. Pulse compression is how we realize the benefit of illuminating the target with more energy, or power times time, to make the range resolution finer and increase our signal to noise ratio. Remember that previously the target could have corresponded to a range anywhere within this pulse width, so the range resolution was dependent on how far the signal traveled during the pulse width tau, or the speed of light times the pulse width over two. Just a quick note though, this pulse width tau is different from the tau in the previous cross correlation equation. This is the pulse width, and this is the time lag that we swept the transmit pulse over. By using pulse compression, we've really improved the detection range resolution. To really see why adding some non-zero bandwidth to the signal reduces the range resolution, and to define by how much we've improved range resolution, let's use this simple scene with only a single target and bring the transmit waveform back to a single frequency sinusoid.
When we compute the cross correlation between transmit and receive, what we get is basically just a sine wave multiplied by a triangle. See, as we slide the transmit across the receive signal, we get more and more overlap, causing the magnitude of the sine wave to change. But since it's just a single frequency sine wave, you still get that oscillatory nature because the transmit and receive signals are going in and out of phase with one another. Going back to just showing the input and correlation output, notice what happens as we start adding bandwidth. With a pure tone, the correlation looks just like a triangle riding on a sine wave. Lots of oscillations, even when the signals only partially overlap. But as we widen the signal's bandwidth, those oscillations cancel out more and more outside the main overlap. The result is that the correlation peak sharpens. Instead of a broad triangular envelope, we get a narrow spike. This is the key. More bandwidth means fewer false alignments as we sweep the transmit pulse over the receive, and that's what gives us the better range resolution. So, the range resolution gets better with increasing bandwidth, or the range resolution is inversely proportional to bandwidth because smaller is better in this case. Really, we just approximate the range resolution in a pulse compressed system to not rely on the transmit pulse, and we have the bandwidth in the denominator. So, why would you not just increase your bandwidth you're transmitting indefinitely and get an infinitesimally small range resolution? Answering that would open this video up to a whole slew of other topics, but some big ones are that large bandwidths make RF boards more difficult to design, regulatory agencies limit the amount of bandwidth you can cover, and there's many, many more. Okay, so we can't get a range resolution of zero meters, but we can do much better with this method without having to trade off the signal to noise ratio. It sounds pretty great, but this is still a radar where there are no easy design choices, so there will be some trade offs. Let's take a closer look at the ringing we saw earlier at the output of the matched filter and see how that'll affect us. Does this look kind of familiar to you? Kind of like a sync function? If you're not familiar, the sync function is just sine of x over x, and its behavior is extremely common throughout many fields. So you may recognize it as looking like an antenna pattern, which I discussed in these videos, or a time series signal converted to the frequency domain, which I've discussed in some form in pretty much every one of my videos. The effect this main lobe has on our detection is pretty obvious, because its width is just the range resolution we've been talking about this whole video. These side lobes, on the other hand, have a less obvious effect on the system. And normally it helps to plot the absolute value of the matched filter output, because it makes it simpler to see the effect of our design choices, like bandwidth. To see this effect, say we have two targets. A large plane, which is causing this return right here, and someone parachuting from the plane. The plane is a large chunk of metal, so it'll have a much larger return than the radar signal absorbent human. After doing pulse compression and matched filtering, we should get two pretty distinct peaks from the targets. But looking at this return, we really only see one and what looks like some noise. The issue here is that the plane's return is large enough that, even though the side lobes are like 13 dB down from the main lobe, 13 dB down from this large return is still larger than the main lobe of the return from the person, so the person just gets masked. Because of this, it's really important to lower the side lobes as much as possible, and this is a very active topic of research. One very common way to mitigate the side lobes is to, instead of using the linear frequency modulation that we have been using, use a phase coding sequence called a Barker code. The Barker code works a little differently than the linear frequency modulation we just saw. Instead of directly influencing the frequency, it takes a sequence of binary numbers, 0 or 1, and applies them to the signal by either giving that section a 0 degree phase shift or a 180 degree phase shift. It's less obvious how this method gives us non-zero bandwidth to use in our matched filter, but what's important about these Barker codes is that if you take the autocorrelation of the sequence, or the correlation to itself, you get really low side lobes at about negative 22.3 dB from the main lobe, much better than the negative 13 dB we saw with the linear frequency modulated waveform. There are many other phase coding techniques too, some using polyphase sequences, meaning the phase can take on more than just zero or 180 degrees, sometimes 90 degree steps or even finer. Each method comes with its own trade-offs between side lobe level, implementation complexity, and even Doppler tolerance.
but I'll save those for a future video. For now, let's step back and recap what pulse compression and matched filtering actually give us. In a pulse compressed system, we take a normal transmit signal, give it some structure, which really just means non-zero bandwidth, wait for it to reflect off one or more targets, and correlate the transmit and receive signals to pull out thin, high signal to noise ratio peaks for each target. If this video was helpful, consider subscribing and giving the video a like. It really helps out. If you want to learn more or practice your new knowledge, check out the Python notebook in the description with interactive examples or check out some of the many other amazing resources on this topic, also in the description. If you want to support the channel even further, I also have some RF and radar themed merch to show your fellow students or coworkers how cool you are, and channel memberships where you can get access to more in depth resources like video walkthroughs of the Python notebooks and more. Thank you all so much for watching.